Hey everybody, welcome back. This is the start of Unit 8. We're going to be talking about land and water pollution. All of Unit 7 was talking about air pollution, so now we're going to talk about what happens on land to the turtles and what happens in the water to the turtles and other animals too. Oh god. Um, so I wanted to start with an aquarium. I went to Atlanta over break and I went to, apparently Atlanta has the world's largest aquarium and I didn't know that, but I went and it was super fun and I saw all these amazing creatures. Um, the manta ray, these cool anemones, and this amazing jellyfish, and so many other cool animals. So if you're ever in Atlanta, you should go to this aquarium because it's amazing. So just some vocab before we get started. Um, point source and non-point source pollution. You'll hear them somewhat often and probably on the test, but a point source is a single identifiable source of a pollutant. For example, a factory smokestack or a waste dis discharge pipe, those are the single place that that pollutant came from. So it's identifiable, you can point at it and say that's where the pollution came from. Non-point non source pollution, it's hard to say, um, comes from many places. It's kind of like a mix, it's harder to identify the one specific p place that the pollution came from. So, for example, you might have some kind of pollutant in a river, but it came from a number of different places you can't just say where it could have come from cities from suburban development from agriculture crops um, deforestation etc there's many different places it could have come from so that's non point source and point source so I'm gonna start talking about the different human impacts we have on ecosystems mostly just what sort of pollution we're adding to different ecosystems but before I start I wanted to talk about something called the range of tolerance so all organisms have a range of tolerance for many different pollutants because most organisms are exposed to natural levels of these pollutants um, and everyone has an ideal range for that type so that they can be exposed to it and stay healthy. When you step outside that ideal range, organisms can experience stress, they don't grow as well, um, they can't reproduce, and they can even die. So what we're going to see a lot of today is, is many different organisms in oceans and on land that are being forced outside the range of tolerance, starting with coral reefs. So I'm sure a lot of you know that coral reefs have experienced a lot of damage, a lot of death over the past 50 or so years, um, but there's a number of different factors that cause this damage, including increased ocean temperatures, sediment runoff, so um, rocks and particles entering the ocean ecosystems, destructive fishing practices, and ocean acidification. And I just want to clarify that ocean acidification is not the same thing as acid rain. This is actually caused by an increase of atmospheric CO2, so then the oceans absorb more, absorb more of that CO2 as well. It's not caused by acid rain, just to clarify. So the next thing we're going to talk about is oil. Humans have quite a deep love of oil, and that's caused quite a bit of damage to our planet. Um, oil spills uh, cause organisms to die from the hydrocarbons in the oil. Also, the oil that floats on the surface of the water can coat different animals' feathers and their fur and make it hard for them to swim or survive. Um, and some components of that oil can even sink to the floor of the ocean and kill organisms that live on the bottom. So really from like surface to the seafloor, it's very destructive. Um, and oil that washes up on the beach, which happens, can have economic consequences for tourism, for fishing industries, because someone has to go clean up that oil. So overall, pretty bad. And this last picture here is from the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill. We're going to talk more about it at the end of the year, but it was this big oil barge that uh, essentially exploded, leaked, and caused quite a bit of damage, as you can see. But we'll get into that more in May. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is dead zones and eutrophication. So let's start by defining dead zones. Dead zones are areas of low oxygen, otherwise known as a hypoxic zone. Hypoxic just means little to no oxygen. Um, and they occur in the oceans due to increased nutrient pollution. So more nutrients being added to the water creates this problem. There's a massive dead zone right on the Gulf of Mexico along Louisiana's coast. And as you can see from all this dark red, there's very little oxygen in that water. So you can imagine what the ecosystems are like in that body of water. So eutrophication is connected to dead zones because it's that process of adding nutrients to water. So it's it occurs when a body of water is enriched or receives a lot more nutrients. Then what happens next is the increase in nutrients causes algal blooms because they want to eat up all those nutrients. There's more nutrients for them to survive on. Eventually the algal blooms will die and microbes will digest the algae. And as they digest them, they take oxygen from the water. 
So this massive algae bloom requires to be broken down, and all that breaking down takes oxygen from the water. The low levels of oxygen kill animals or force them to leave because now there's a zone where there's very little oxygen because all of the microbes have taken it away. And this leads to dead zones or hypoxic zones because there's no available oxygen. Um, so again, added nutrients, that's eutrophication. The nutrients create algae blooms. Algae will die and decompose. The, deco the microbes will help to break them down. And in that process, they take oxygen um, from the water to create that dead zone. So how do humans come into this? Why is it on a slide called human impacts? Well, humans are a big source of eutrophication. Um, a lot of agricultural runoff leads to excess nutrients, nitrogen, fertilizers, pesticides going into the water that can create this eutrophied area. Um, and same thing with wastewater being released into aquatic or ocean environments. You have the same thing. Those um, pollutants are actually nutrients for the water. So the more that we dump into the oceans and rivers, the more of these dead zones we'll start to see. Scary stuff. So I'm just going to briefly cover some other aquatic pollution sources. Uh, litter obviously is very ugly and can also damage wildlife like you see in this picture. It can cause choking, blockages in digestive systems, and introduce new toxins into the food chain. So overall it sucks. Um, heavy metals are also used in mining and fossil fuels and they can reach into the groundwater um, and impact our drinking water supply, which is the case for Flint, Michigan, which we'll talk more about later. Um, increased sediment, which I mentioned with um, coral reefs, is things like rock sand and other solids being introduced into the water. That sediment can actually block um, sun's infiltration, which means sun can't get into the ocean, which can affect primary producers and predators that rely on light. Um, and sediment can also settle in and disrupt a habitat. So think of a water bottle that's full of like sand, dirt, and rocks, and then imagine living at the bottom of it when all that stuff settles, it won't be good. And mercury. So mercury is released from the burning of fossil fuels like coal, and once it enters the water, bacteria can convert it into something super toxic called methylmercury, and it can cause damage to the fish, to the things that eat the fish, including humans. Uh, so those are four other sources of pollution. Um, and all four are very damaging and serious, and all four can be linked directly to humans. So humans really are causing quite a bit of pollution, in case you didn't know already. Okay, so I want to talk about wetlands and mangroves, because they do come up so often on this test. Um, wetlands are an area where water covers the soil, either part of or all the time. So we even have wetlands in New York, but it's an area where there's pretty much just water and then plants kind of growing around or in that water. Mangroves are these unique trees and their roots are almost constantly submerged in super salty waters along coasts or rivers and most plants would die if they were in these conditions exposed to tons of salt like that but mangroves are adapted to this climate and they actually thrive in it and they're pretty beautiful. <laughs> um, but wetlands and mangroves provide a lot of ecosystem services. Um, they clean water, they help protect against floods, they filter water, and then they provide tons of habitat for other animals. Um, they're also, of course, being threatened by development, commercial development, um, building of dams. Overfishing can damage the area around the wetlands or even the mangroves themselves, and pollutants from agriculture and industry. So they are facing quite a few human-made threats. And I have this video I wanted to show um, so you guys can see like why mangroves are so important. So this is what mangroves actually, one of the benefits of mangroves. So you can imagine during a storm how beneficial that is. This helps protect the shore, keep it safe from heavy erosion when tides increase, when a storm surge hits that area. So mangroves rock. Okay, so the last slide is about thermal pollution. Thermal pollution occurs when heat is released into water, and you wouldn't really think that it's something that has negative consequences on an ecosystem, but it really does, because um, because different water temperatures have different levels of oxygen, and warm water does not contain as much oxygen as cold water. So if an influx of warm water enters into an ecosystem, it's not going to have as much oxygen. So what causes thermal pollution? 
Things like power plants or energy facilities will often take water from a stream or a river and they'll use it to either cool a machine or help in the, the process of making energy. And then they'll put it back with an altered temperature after having used it. So that's an, a source of thermal pollution. So that's it for land and water pollution for now. I know it's a lot of information, but I hope you enjoy. Oh, I do have some extra credit for you, so you can answer all three or just one. The first is, what is the world's second largest aquarium? The second one is, who is the star actor of the movie about the massive oil spill that I talked about? And the third one, which will probably be worth a few more points, is how do sediments damage coral reefs? So feel free to answer all of them, none of them, or just one. Okay, bye!